I'm I'm more from the the product side. So um, obviously the enemy of of, of 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 developers and and scrum masters abound. But um, I thought I'd um, spend a little bit of time talking about some of the experiences of of, of how we've been as as a company and and as a team kind of coping through the the current sort of crisis. Effectively, I mean I will say that the coronavirus situation has been a a completely unexplained crisis and. It's interesting because back back at the beginning of the year, I actually had a, a, a an episode where um, like half my face stopped working for a few weeks. Like it's called Bell's palsy. It's just something that can happen, and that was for me like the worst thing that was going to happen that year. And then all of a sudden, everything else happened that year, and it, and it's just been a complete car crash. And I'm obviously really um, I really hope that every single person on this call, everyone that's working for all the different types of companies on this call having a really you know they're, they're coming out of it because it's it, it's it's been horrible in many ways and um, i hope that you're all okay um just a, a kind of setting the scene a little bit so you know who out who i am that's the only acceptable picture of me these days um any other picture just gets older like in a, in a novel um so i'm uh, i had the product team at a company called black swan data so a slightly different type of company to, to the other uh, presenters tonight uh, much much smaller um much newer um, my own personal background, I'm a, I'm a rehabilitated um, developer and nerd, so I've uh, spent a lot of time in my past working in um, analytics and um, working in sort of operations management, moving into sort of full stack web development and then into um, product over the years. So really starting to move um, over the years into not just developing the stuff that we want to, to give to people, but actually starting to understand why that's actually important to develop and getting really interested in the roadmap and really trying to understand our users. So it's been an interesting journey and I've, I've worn a lot of hats in my time, but in, in the kind of spirit of T-shaped people, I think it's been really, um, it's been really helpful for my career to make sure that I understand kind of what, what's going on and, and, and what's important. Um, been at Black Swan Data for about 18 months. I started beginning of last year. Just now, since no one's heard of Black Swan, just a, a brief um, description of what we're doing. So you again can understand maybe some of the challenges that I'm going to be talking about. I've actually got kind of three arms. Um, I, w I work for Black Swan Data, so the, the top right, and we, we're basically a machine learning powered, AI powered, uh, trend analytics and prediction platform. So we offer uh, uh, solutions to our customers, which are very large con uh, consumer goods companies. So people that sell stuff in shops and pubs and bars and restaurants, uh, and try and tell them where, what, what things they should be looking at next. Uh, what, what's the big trends in their category based on social conversation, uh, publicly available news articles and stuff like that. We've also got another couple of arms, so Feather, who do a lot of the lot of really cool stuff in, in aviation, and White Swan, who I'd love to talk to you about later because that's a charity that we also run, uh, working in the sort of healthcare space, and using prediction to really understand how to help make people know what's wrong with them and, and how they can get better. So I will say that it's been a really interesting time um, over the last few years, but as I said, we're, we're, we're really working with, in two kind of core verticals, sort of consumer goods, so things that people are selling in shops and planes. And I'll say that again, consumer goods and planes, and I'll say it again, consumer goods and planes, because that'll be relevant in a minute. But I'll also say that by the beginning of uh, Q1, or it's coming into this year, we were doing really well. We had had a really good 2019, with a really strong growth, we we're growing our SaaS business, we were growing our professional services business, um, really getting a lot of big clients on board and, and, and really knocking it out of the park. Uh, and we were looking to come into 2020 strong and we were looking to really uh, scale even further and, and, and really get it over the line. We had strong strategic alignment from, uh, the, from the top down. You know, we, we had a good company strategy. We had all of our core KPIs. We had recently reshuffled, uh, changed our ways of working and reshuffled into squads aligned around certain missions. So, you know, kind of, uh, you know, really optimizing the way that we worked and we'd had a really cool roadmap built out showed all of the features that we needed to do everything was got looking fantastic really rosy everything was on, on on point and then we got punched in the mouth now i love this quote and i don't know if mike tyson actually said it or if it's another sort of faster horse type quote um but i think it's really relevant because ultimately it really shows in some ways the kind of the fallacy of planning because of course any plan immediately gets disrupted as soon as it actually meets the, the outside world. So um, yeah, Mike Tyson, if you did say that, 
it's got a signature. I guess he probably did, but thank you. But obviously, the, the, the opponent in this case was the Armageddon itself, coronavirus. So it's obviously been a complete nightmare for everyone. I mean, I, I don't know how how many people we have in this, in this on this call um, that have been affected directly or furloughed or their companies have been having trouble, but it's obviously been a complete nightmare. And, and I really feel for all of the people that have been affected. But, you know, you only have to look on LinkedIn to see some of the, you know, all the little green swooshes and stuff, all the people that have been laid off. And it's been, a, it's been quite a bad time. But as a company, obviously, we've done uh, the best we can to really weather the storm. And, you know, we're a small company with big clients. So we, we need to make sure that we're pushing in the right direction to make sure that we're making the right decisions, keep moving forward and try and just get through it as best we can. And that's really relevant for a company that works with uh, consumer goods companies and airlines for most of its trade, because obviously that industry has been completely trashed, or both of those industries have been completely trashed over the last few months with the recession and all the problems in the aviation industry. Um, yeah, we're lucky we've got some really good clients and we've got some really good partnerships. So it's not like uh, it was a massive disaster for us, but it's obviously still a concern. You, you really want to be in a situation where your clients are being strong so that you can keep you know get, getting the revenue to keep turning the handle and keep delivering the features that are going to really be giving the best va uh, value to those people so definitely an interesting time so maintaining a roadmap that's the first bullet point on my on my chat so um really just obviously just concentrating a little bit on on you know like how we try to maintain continuity so i would say that one of the biggest rules of product management is um to make sure that you're almost like a, a bastion of stability. You're there to kind of stand as a, as a wall against the potential avalanche of, of customer requirements and obviously the, all of the internal requirements, all of the feature requests. And the most important thing that any product person can do in this sort of situation or in any sort of situation is don't panic, keep it calm, you've got it, just calm it down and, and, and apply product principles to make sure that you're, um, you, you're going through it in the right way. And I guess the question then would be, well, what is a roadmap? So that's there's five billion medium posts about a roadmap and what a roadmap is and what a roadmap isn't. You know, is a roadmap a project plan? Is it is it a Gantt chart? I mean, I love I love the um, there's there's a quote from so I think it was from uh, I don't know it was from someone um, basically saying that a Gantt chart is an amazing, wonderfully crafted graphic that immediately goes out of date as soon as you save it. It's just completely irrelevant by the time you've, you, you, you've published it because it immediately changes. You know, is it just an Excel sheet full of tasks? Probably not. Is it a list of just the coolest sounding stuff or the things that your competitors are doing that your CEO was interested in? I would say myself, it, is, it should be none of those things. So roadmap is it's a strategic document. It's a document that shows you where your team and your company needs to go and what you and your teams need to do to get there. So some things that were important before all this happened remain important today. So that means you don't just sit there and say all of a sudden, everyone's screaming, everyone's hair's on fire. We need to immediately start um, just doing anything, running around in, in random directions and, and just trying to hope that, it, that you can just survive. Because some things are just important and you do still need to keep doing them. So there are things, for example, in our company, we, we're an enterprise sale. We work with a lot of big companies and uh, we had a lot of features that we'd already planned in, um, things like uh, SSO, which uh, whilst not exactly the most glamorous feature, was a, a big kind of stickiness unlock with our clients. So we were we really wanted to make sure that we got that over the line. We were working a lot on um, sort of new use cases and driving new opportunities for upselling and cross-selling, lots of sort of platform improvements, fixing technical debt. You just you can't just stop doing these just because there's uh, the global pandemic. I mean, frankly. That's as good a reason as any, but you should still stick to your principles. But you do have to beware the sunk cost fallacy or the gambler's fallacy. You can't just sit there and do it because you were working on it. Because ultimately, uh, a product roadmap, a, a plan, it's not something that you just sit there and bake it in at the beginning of the year. It's the concrete sets and you're done. It's something that you should always be conscious of the fact that just because you started working on something doesn't mean you have to finish. There's always, there's always a chance to switch. It comes on to my next point around pragmatism. So by that, what I mean is that ultimately, the first rule of, of product and product management is 
your job isn't to stick to a plan so much as to find your user's most valuable problem and solve it. Now, my biggest takeout here would be to look exactly where that uh, apostrophe is. Uh, it's not a, a user's most valuable problem. It's all of your user's most valuable problem or the majority of your user's most valuable problem. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the thing is with um, our users, uh, which I'll come to in a minute, is that actually their, um, their, problem, their biggest problem all of a sudden wasn't anything that we had on the roadmap. Their biggest problem for all of these companies that we're working with was what the hell do we do now with the COVID here? You're a predictive analytics company. You're here to, to tell us what the future holds and, and where we should place our money and where we should place our bets. So, well, that's a really important thing. So um, we obviously had to take account of that in our, in our output. So we refocused um, some of our squads, uh, uh, or at least one of our squads, um, around um, trying to answer that question. So using some of the data that we had and, and using some of the data scientists that we have in the squads, and really um, shuffled those around to make sure that we had the right people in the right place to do the right research, the right development, to actually make sure that we were answering those questions for people. And that and it gave us lots of great advantages. It helped us to kind of prop up the uh, proposition that we offer for our professional services. You know, all of the people that were getting consulting outputs from us, they were desperate to know about COVID and, and what that meant to them. And we were able to provide the, the consulting team with, with information about that. And it also gave us really valuable inputs for our, our product, our, for our SaaS platform. So we were able to, to incorporate some of that work into our SaaS platform and come out, of a, come out of the back of it with a really strong, much improved offering, which really helped us to, um, to, to demonstrate value and obviously really helped us with sales conversations as well. But I think that actually whilst, you know, resp having to change things unexpectedly is, is, is kind of inconvenient. At the same time, it's, it's really helpful when it drives actual innovation. So I don't want there to be um, pandemics all the time, but it certainly drives things in, in the face of necessity. And that's the thing I'd say is also just from a roadmap perspective, I mean, obviously it's not controversial to say you shouldn't fall in love with it. You, know, you have to change it. If the most valuable problem changes, then it's definitely time to, um, to change up and, and but do that based on actual information and, and, and trying to identify the most uh, important thing to solve. Um, so a little bit of a pivot now into into communication and actually touching on some of the points that, that some of the other speakers have, have spoken about regarding um, kind of communication and, and, and culture to some extent. So I feel that in many ways a product team's one of its main jobs is, is playing a, a role in communication between different parts of the business. I mean there's that stupid Venn diagram with the, the dot in the middle with the you are here the view stuck between all different parts of the business and it's obviously valid to some extent I think it's really important to make sure that you're facilitating those discussions and facilitating that communication to make sure that everyone's on board especially in times of change so you know we need to keep our users informed we need to make them aware of any changes to the roadmap because whilst the roadmap should never be set in stone at the same time you need to make sure that when the stones shift that people are aware of that and you also need to maintain alignment with, with the stakeholders, with the, the, all of our cross-functional teams, all of the code. Yeah, we've got five squads in our, uh, in our company working on different parts of the platform. Um, you need to make sure that they're all aligned and, uh, and all pulling in the right direction. And again, some of, the, some of that kind of matches up to some of the discussions that we've been having earlier tonight. So I guess uh, one of the things, first of all, that we were really conscious of within the company and really tried to do well within the product team is... Um, really doubling down on the communication, um, making sure that, that, that everyone's in touch because you know, all of a sudden we're all remote. Um, no one can see each other anymore. No one can just have a quick chat anymore. Everything's a meeting. Uh, and, and that's fine, apart from when it's not. And ultimately, after a while, I don't know about anyone else on this call, but I started to feel a bit of kind of cognitive load you know, because I'm every single time I need to talk to anyone, I've got to set up a 30 minute Zoom meeting. Um, and that's not always helpful. So we, some of these things were things we we're already doing, but we really tried to double down on, on some of the communication strategies that we'd identified before. So um, one of the things that we found quite helpful as a team is uh, uh, like a product stand-up. And I think uh, that was one of the cards on the, on the board that we saw earlier, like actually having effectively a 15 minute stand-up every day for the product team. It's not really a stand-up because the stand-ups are, the stand-ups, they're, they're, they're in the squads, but actually sitting there and spending the time, 
regular stock work to just sit there and talk about things that are important to, our, to us as a team, making sure we don't have any blockers and frankly, just having a quick chance to have a chat. It's been really uh, useful. We also tried to replicate the um, kind of warm water cooler thing. I think I saw uh, another uh, card on the on the previous um, uh, previous board about like trying to replicate that more kind of potluck chat. Uh, set up a Discord server, tried to be cool gamers. Didn't really work. Everyone just left it on mute all the time. So we turned that off. The company have started doing things like um, uh, random lotteries of coffee and stuff like that. I just think that one of the things, whilst I'm really comfortable working from home, from my perspective, there's still so many benefits from working in the office. And um, I'm not one of these like LinkedIn people that just sit there saying, I've saved £5,000 and I'm working from home all the time and I'm never going back to the office. I'm fine working from home, but I think that sometimes you, don't, you, you do miss that kind of one-to-one -one ability to just have a spitball a, a problem. And you've got to keep in touch with your squads as well. So one of the things that we also shook up was making sure, you, again, we have five squads. So we, uh, we've got a lot of people working on different streams. And when you're in the office, that's fine. You can kind of hear what people are doing. You can look at what people are doing. You can talk to people. Um, but again, everyone's remote. So we, we kind of shook that up and, and came up with what we've uh, cheekily called the mega demo. So the mega demo was basically at the end of every sprint. We'd just get all of the teams to demo all at the same time, not literally all at the same time, but within the same meeting. And that really helped to drive some of the communication so that all of the people working at all of the different parts of our platform and our, and our offering had a really good understanding of what all the other teams were working on. And obviously still going for the retros and obviously you can still maintain daily stand-ups and having really proactive working sessions so that we could always like swarm around an issue if we needed to. Um, keeping in touch with our stakeholders. I mean, I love this, this picture for many reasons, but it also obviously replicates the, the product manager's life in, in, in a nutshell. Um, but one of the things that we've also really tried to keep up and, and really double down on is what we call a sort of show and tell session. So um, uh, myself and, and, and the team will go out every two weeks and present to all hands. It's a webinar, we'll record it, share it, just let everyone know what we've been working on and then what we're gonna be working on next. And then like a presentation at the end of, uh, about like how the roadmap's looking, if anything's changing, any other generic news that's gonna be affecting the product delivery. And I think that that's been a really fantastic way of just making sure that the company's aligned both with what we're currently doing and how we're tracking against the company vision. So if anyone's not doing a, a show and tell type session as, as sort of an agile or delivery slash product team, I, I, I would definitely recommend it to, to try and drive that uh, stakeholder alignment. And also, yeah, this getting, keeping in touch with our customers. So, I mean, obviously the customers are those that pay the bills and I don't know why that's a Bitcoin now. I should have chosen different. Oh, they're all, they're all cryptocurrencies, damn it. Um, but basically making sure that you're keeping in touch with customers because ultimately the product cliche is that, um, you know, your customers are uh, the most important uh, people. And of course they are, they, they pay the bills. They're the ones that, that, that you're trying to serve. So making sure that as product people, you're maintaining the best practice of talking to your customers all the time, having your sessions, looking at your customer acti activity and, and data to make sure that you're, you're really um, in line or in touch with their needs. Because uh, I personally think that any product team that isn't um, constantly in touch with the internal or external customers, uh, users of the platform, is, is, is missing a part of its remit. Uh, and I guess uh, and the final point on communication is just don't be scared to, uh, to over-egg it. I think there's a, a real trend, I guess, to, to, make, to try to not repeat yourself or not to bore people. And obviously I'm failing at that at the moment, but at the same time, just making sure that, that you keep everyone up to date. And frankly, you can never say, that, say something enough. From my perspective, if you're not bored of hearing it yourself, you've probably not said it enough times. There's loads of reasons why people won't have remembered what you're saying or uh, you know, have, a, have a solid idea about every single aspect. Just keep saying it, keep sharing it, keep making sure that everyone's aligned and on board. Take questions when you can and just make sure that you're, that you're hitting the communication as much as possible because you can't do it enough. And I guess the, the, the final point is about coming out strong. I know I'm nearly at time. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, it has been a hard few months and obviously we're still terrified of this sort of second dip and or second second spike and you know what's coming next and we have to be conscious of course that again lots of companies have had trouble lots of our colleagues again you see it on LinkedIn there's the, the people are in trouble um, but most importantly from all of this and again I touched on this earlier is just for the, the kind of the concept that you really just need to be able to come out stronger and 
use the things that you learn and the improved ways of working, the optimizations that you had to put in place to keep yourself going. Try and use the best of those to, to move forward and, and, and you know, keep servicing what you're doing. So there's things like optimizing how we work and collaborate. Um, someone touched on it earlier, sort of enabling uh, asynchronous communica communication. There's plenty of reasons why people aren't going to be able to just communicate in meetings all the time. You know, there's going to be people that have childcare responsibilities. There's going to be ebbs and flows in people's workloads. And I think it's just really important to make sure that you lean into things like Slack and, and really double, say double down a lot, but just double down on, uh, on enabling that sort of thing. And also leaning into your empowered team. So you can't just sit there micromanaging your teams and you, and you, you clearly shouldn't anyway. But if you do have remote teams, making sure that you give them the information that they need to, to do what they need to do. Set up the feedback loops so that they can feed back to you and let you know if you need to course quick and trust your teams to, to, to work and, and empower them to, to deliver. And they're using smart tooling. So just making, I saw this other thing earlier, I can't remember what it's called now, but I'm a big fan of things like Miro. So using platforms like that to really replace the kind of the whiteboarding and uh, allow you to collaborate much more effectively. I'm sure there are plenty of other tools, but that's the one I use. And the last last slide for me, just making sure that, that you're ready to go. So like, you know, again, just taking the best of what we've, what we've uh, learned and, and some of the ways that we've had to adapt our working practices, making sure that we're really focused on what the customer needs and answering their most important questions and just um, really using maybe as we come out of, some of the hell that we've been in in the last few months, just really using what we've learned to, to, to keep driving forward, refocus, concentrate on what's important uh, and, and just go forward and, and just keep delivering value. And that's me. Um, if, if you're not bored and I can't hear you, so I'll have to presume that you're not. There's a few ways to, to follow me. I've, I actually put this LinkedIn thing in at the last minute because um, I, I saw it and it looked cool. So I had to try and work out how to do that very quickly. Um, but there's a few ways to contact me. And obviously, if anyone is interested in finding out about our sort of healthcare charity, um, I'd be happy to chat about that. Or obviously, you can click on that link and, and, and find out for yourself. So thank you very much. Any questions? Thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, we, we have um, one from um, Parole. Um, so that they asked, do you think work from home impacts innovation? Because you can't have those spontaneous, spontaneous chats, collaborations with people that you would do when you're in the office. I think it's it's obviously more difficult, and and it, it is a really traditional way of looking at things to sit there and say, oh well, let's all sit around the we work bar, you know, beer taps, and have a chat and innovate, and all the ideas crackle above our head, and and you know, obviously that there is that is fun. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, I think that for me, it's all about that point about sort of leaning into the, um, really leaning into it, so really leaning into tools and ways you know so one of the things i will say is that we 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 were a distributed company anyway so we've got offices in hungary we've got offices in america sort of western east coast we've got offices in different parts of england so part of it was kind of natural anyway that we had to we've always had to to work remotely and, and kind of try and get that crackle across a, a zoom link or equivalent um i think that in a, to, to be frank maybe that was something we didn't do always amazingly before and one of the things that i would say that we've got out of this is kind of going for the kind of one, uh, one remote all remote type uh, rule which i mean it's not a rule but more of a guideline like if we can sit there and make sure that everyone's engaged that you've not got like nine people in a room all crackling and one person on the line just barely hearing people so sort of concentrating on those tools using some of the really fantastic sort of collaboration tools and um kind of online online sharing and, and on, online idea op, um, optimization boards and all that stuff. Is it the same as all sitting around a, a table we are drinking lattes and, and scribbling stuff down on a, on a, on a pad? Probably not. But at the same time, I think as long as you lean into it and you really push that kind of remote collaboration and the remote tools, then there's plenty out there to help you get that done these days. And um, the next question from Hamid, um, they say, do you think more companies will adopt Agile considering the pan pandemic has caused people to adopt new ways of working? Huh. So I think that lots of companies either think they are or are trying to be Agile. And obviously uh, there's being, there's doing Agile, there's being Agile, there's all the different types of Agile. And there's obviously lots of cliches about like the, the, the types of 
of agile transformations that some, especially bigger companies, uh, can um, find themselves in. Uh, from my perspective, I think that agile is definitely the way that people are going, even if it's just agile in name only, because for me, I think it's got it's enough of the zeitgeist that just people aren't gonna. I don't think there's much, there are any fans of waterfall walking uh, working unless it's in really regulated industries or industries that have really strict kind of uh, seasonal stuff. Or whatever. Whether actually it's, it's interesting because one of our uh, uh, some of our clients in the aviation uh, industry, you know, you've got to get stuff on planes. That's not easy to you can't just continuously deploy it to a plane. So there's obviously some level of kind of scheduling around that stuff and sort of good old fashioned project management. But I think from my perspective, I can't really see that many people just sitting there choosing waterfall as a, as a, as a method unless they've got a really specialized use case. But I think also with regards to that question, it's like, well, yeah, sure. The pandemic and the new ways of working, I mean, you, you can waterfall remotely. I recommend it, but you can. Um, I think it's more like, do I see that people are going to be in, encouraging more kind of distributed and remote working and remote col uh, collaboration? I absolutely think that. I think that there are a number of companies already that have said, well, you know, you can work from home forever or you can work from home for, for years or, or whatever. And I, I don't see that going away. I think that if this was, if the, the pandemic had been like a, a two day thing or something like that, it would have just been a blip and every, everything would have just carried on. But I think it's lasted for long enough now that, um, it's going to have a sort of a seismic shift in in attitudes, and because people have had to realise that people can basically do their jobs from home, unless you're literally physically having to touch people, you can basically do your job at home, and and uh, or you know if you have really specialised equipment, but even that could be replicated. So I think that it's going to be a massive trend uh, going forward after we come out of this. Can I can I think with you for a second there, Jason? So um, my challenge to everyone on the call is. Um, Agile roundabout, but probably we apply it when it's needed. I think that's what you're coming to, right, Jason? And probably Ben, thinking with you here, is you have waterfall, you have lean, you have you have loads of different methodologies. But um, it's about when do you need this? So we're saying when an organisation needs an agile. Mm -hmm. um, do I, I'd actually rephrase that? My question to you is is do organizations seem to be more responsive and flexible to adapt to the economic situation, the, de the, de the changing demands of the customer. Jason mentioned something really pertinent by Marty Kagan as well. His books inspired phenomenal. This guy's like the, the OG of product world. They don't really care about terms. Mm -hmm. it, and it, it, it's, it's a bit controversial, but all of us have learned them though. We've mm -hmm. learned how to use and deploy them. So at the end of, end of the day, it sounds like Jason, Ben, all of us are focused on where does the value sit and how do we pivot to find it? Because day one, like today, it's the value was in coffees, actual physical coffees, right? People were buying them. Now it's on deliver. Now it's on, can I get my coffee delivered to me? So can we, can we change our business and our model to adapt to that? Or can we, can we flex that? Because if we can't, that's where we're seeing retailers Old, older organizations that haven't been able to respond as quickly, literally just pulling out of, of physical locations. And I don't think that's a trend we're gonna, we're gonna see die out. We're gonna see Amazon and everyone, and we can see through the deregulation talks in the US right now with the big four, what's happening? Everyone's turning around and saying, well, these guys are gonna get more powerful. In a way, it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, but Jason's pertinent point is, pivot to where the customers and that's what i do i advocate as well it doesn't matter what you use i've uh, i've just got one final thought if that's okay because i feel quite passionate about this the question being do you think companies adopt an agile way of working i really believe that the generation coming into the workforce aren't going to want to work any other way and the reason being agile values it's people focused it's fast and iterative it's about working solutions it's about the customer the millennial generation have got the attention span of a teaspoon. Most of the guys that I started at Vodafone with um, around a similar kind of time, you know, a lot of grads leaving university, the majority of them left after a year because they get bored and they want to move on to the next thing. So there's no way that you're going to be able to run projects with two year roadmaps where nothing exciting happens for a long time because the workforce coming through, the young designers, developers, they'll just get bored and they'll go somewhere else. 
So I don't think companies are going to have a choice because if they want to retain the workforce coming through who value that speed, who value that, that customer relationship, um, who value all those things that I think Agile has at its core, um, they're going to have to. I think they're going to have to adopt Agile, whether they like all the terminologies and the frameworks or not. They're going to have to adopt the Agile values and ben, certainly a number of the principles. And I was saying, Ben, you sound like an entrepreneur, the way you're speaking. <laughs> like, like, uh, we, we, I think we all share a DNA strand here is that we build stuff that people, we, we try to build stuff people want. And it's hard, right? It's a, it's really hard. And you're, you're right, though. It's um, We're seeing those the general environment, if you you have to have that balance between the environment and what has to be delivered. Um, just curious on a second, how have you how have you addressed that? I know that we've got a few more minutes to chew the fat, but like I, I can empathize with that. That's one of the attraction points in a career. But have you put it as a, a strict measure on people you hire? Is it just something do you try to almost see the cultural fit of people when you bring them into the organization? Just thinking with you. We, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. A lot of our kind of HR marketing promotional stuff recently has been around, we're an agile company, which has been great. We shifted a load of our operation from Newbury to London, which again was really good at attracting young talent in London. Um, if I look around, well, the, I, look, I say I look around the office, I can't, but if I was in the office in London and I looked around the office, it, the majority of people would be fairly young. And I think they're probably staying around with us a little bit longer than perhaps they may do if it was a different working environment. So I think it's definitely something the business are doing. And I think whether they realize they're doing it well or not, they are doing it well. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a reason that lots of young people like to go and work for startups now. And, you know, it's not very fashionable to go and work for a bank. It's fashionable to go and work for Monzo, isn't it? So and I think that's not just reflective of a trend, but it's reflective of the way of working. And it's not just beer fridges and ping pong tables. But oh, it's hard work. It's the autonomy. It's, it's the autonomy. It's the customer focus. It's the attitude um, and I think the kind of the respect between the guys at the top and the guys doing the work. And yeah. I think that all stems from agile values. Layers. So, yeah, I, I like yeah. the thing that you just said is, is there's not much middle fat, right? So, um, but w- one thing I, I was reading Jeff Bezos's first um, letter to shareholders. I got told about reading these recently, um, but he said something in that that probably hits home, which is, when he's looking for people, he said, I want people that basically going to work hard, work smart and work long hours. He said, if you're meeting only two of those, this isn't a place for you. But I think, I think that's the balance, right? Is it's, it is an intense environment though. If you get in there and you do this right and you try and churn out products fast that succeed, but it doesn't mean it can't be fun. I think that's what you're alluding to. It, It can be intense at moments, but make sure that we keep it attractive. Otherwise, we, it's just going to be us sitting in a room going with loads of post-it notes, what went on. <laughs> but, it should, but it should be really exciting to make cool stuff, right? I mean, that's yeah. the whole point. And even old, even old people like me like working at startups because it's it's it, it, like the energy and the urgency of, of, of making this stuff. And the, you obviously, waterfall and urgency, uh, very... You know, they don't really match together that well because of the sort of more extended timelines. But I think that the critical point out of all of that is, you, I think you kind of touched on it as well. Like your, your customer doesn't care how you made it. Exactly. Your customer doesn't. So for us, you know, we we we've got loads of machine learning and AI and cool buzzwords sort of powering a lot of our prediction technology. But frankly, if I, if we could offer the same stuff uh, supported by five thousand people filling it in manually, yeah. the customers would buy it just the same as long as it was the same price. And it's the same with methodology. You know, people shouldn't care whether you're lean or you're scrum or you're Kanban or you're yeah. Yeah. extreme this or you're on yeah. fire that, you know. It's, it's, good, it's, it's good to have a toolkit, right? It's good to have a, it's exactly. important to, it's fundamental to have a toolkit based on where your product's at. But it's, um, yeah. it is, it is the application, you know, like a, a, a Kung Fu master or someone who's great at jujitsu and stand up Muay Thai and stuff. They know how to deploy this at the right time. And it's the same thing with this is, you got to spend, you, it was really interesting how the T-shaped talk, because if you take time to actually learn these things, and the thing is, it does just take time and experience, um, then you can deploy at the right time. And then you can find a new situation, especially right now. And this is one thing I think Jason and Ben really emphasized is, regard, this is a challenging situation. It's going to test practitioners. And it, look at this contrast, though. I was just thinking about this. We're talking about, do we need agile practitioners? but then look at how many people are on the market right now, right? 
there's possibly a contrast going on. If you needed it that heavily, why are there so many? So my, my question to you is, look at what do you need? Is it lean? Do you just need people who can drive good product behaviors? And then if you're in a situation trying to find a job, adapt yourself or upskill. And maybe Jason, Ben, if you have any good resources, specifically that event, the Avengers website as well. Was, it's, I wish I had something like that when I started out. It was old school, like it was the, the PDFs that you had written down and then you spoke to friends until you got some and you made up some tools and techniques. But that's, that's gold. And then Jason as well, if, if you have any recommended material, maybe just add you guys on LinkedIn. You can yeah. share it well. Yeah. No, and also just, just yeah. regarding LinkedIn, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm always delighted to waffle on about product and, and the sort of agile delivery and, and frankly, anything technical and nerdy as well, because I just find it all fascinating. So feel free to, any, anyone on this call, feel free to drop me a line, ask me any questions, or if, if you think that I'm in any way qualified to answer them or just shout at me I'm, I'm, it fascinates me all of it so I'm yeah, I, I agree if anyone wants to contact everyone go and contact Jason not me because <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be on holiday for the next four days <laughs> right, thank you very much guys really really informative and yeah i just like to to thank everybody um, for taking the time out on, on Thursday to, to tune in and again thank you for the speakers some really interesting topics and and this is what these communities are all about to start the discussion and um, if you if you want to continue the discussion then um, please feel free um, to, to contact any of these guys on, on LinkedIn or comment on on the the Archel roundabout LinkedIn page um,